Blues Season 3, Episode 9 starts now, and I promise you this one's a big one. I'm Brandon Davis, joined today by Aaron Perrine. Someone get Brandon Davis a nap. He's been yeah. doing too much. He's been carrying Grogu around. <laughs> I need my man to get some rest. Bro, all I'm trying to do is watch the Mandalorian premiere, and I'm like <laughs> dodging spoilers like... Like I'm pl- like I'm Ben Stiller in dodgeball because I I say that because he lost. I feel like I'm not gonna win this one, but I'm doing my best. Ah, oh, Jenna Anderson's here. Hey everybody, I'm so happy to be back. I genuinely missed being on the show last week because I had to go do all the little quantum media interviews, but I'm very happy to be here, especially because we have a lot to talk about today. You did a great job on those quantum mania interviews. Those were so fun to read. I wish they would have let us record video because I wanted to see you talking to everybody. <laughs> But uh, that was David really Dasmalchian is the coolest person alive. Like oh. we we could have talked for like an hour just about Chicago and comic book shops and stuff there. So that was that alone was so worth it. That was so and, much fun. Hold on, before we move on, you also were the person to break the news <laughs> about Modoc's booty to Corey Cole, <laughs> is my understanding. I seem to have been the first person to have told him that people were reacting to Modoc's butt. Like he obviously <laughs> was in the movie. He that he went in some, like an attic of like fought to keep it in the movie. But I I was like one of the first interviews of the day, and so he was like, I didn't know there was fervor around this aspect of the movie. So I was like, wow, I get to break the news to him that people are talking about this. That was just crazy. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. Uh, and we. We got Jamie Girac here today. Yeah, look at us. Core four doing it. Wee! We're here. This is a big <laughs> show. In the second half of the show, Ant Man of the Wasp, Quantumania writer, Avengers the Kang Dynasty writer, Jeff Loveness is here to tell all. I promise you, Avengers questions are coming your way. There is answers. Maybe not. I mean, I don't know if there's answers, but there's attempts uh, to get answers with Jeff Loveness. And Jeff's an awesome guy. So I want to see a lot of positivity in the comment section. A lot of love for Jeff when we get to that second half of the show today. But first, we got a lot of MCU news to catch up. Well, not, maybe, not, maybe not a lot, but some actual pretty significant news to talk about uh, with one really exciting thing that came after last week's show. Jenna, you, you, have, you have theories on this one, so I'm going to let you take this one. So, yeah, so Stephen Young of The Walking Dead, of Nope, of countless other really great movies and TV shows has been added to the cast of Thunderbolts. Um, obviously, they aren't saying who he's playing, but there are some rumors saying that like it's going to be a significant role that could be in multiple things. Um, I'm very curious what everyone else's theories are. I am of the team of he, he might be Sentry. That would be really cool. It was. I know there's some people. There's so many other theories. I'm so happy he's in the MCU to begin with. So either way, we're winning. But what do you guys think? Who do you think he's playing? I don't know who he's playing, but I'm so excited he's going to be there. Uh, that's I'm like I'm hyped about that. Uh, I like your theory. I'm into it. I'm here for it. <laughs> I, I think Sentry is a pretty good option. I think Speedball is possible too. I, I was reading through our chat. Uh, in the comicbook.com editorial Slack. And I think Evan Valentine was in there like, oh, he's got to be speedball. It's like, ah, that would make sense too. I just think this is a huge W. This feels like, you know, Ant-Man came out and a lot of, you know, people, you know, it's so trendy now to hate on Marvel. It's like now everybody, it's become what The Walking Dead became in a lot of ways. Like, it's just, oh, this show's still on. Well, people just love hate. They, it's like, you know, it's a, everybody thinks they're cool when they talk negatively about Marvel in comment sections now. And this feels like one of those things that all those people, you know, just when they thought they were out, they pull you back in. Steven Young is such a great get for the MCU that any there's you can't say anything negative about this. This is great news. And I hope he gets a, I hope it's not a wasted and this is a shout out to Eric Voss. But he he I saw him tweeting about this and I couldn't agree more. Don't waste him. Like William Jackson Harper in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Don't do any of these BS kind of low level, like new character wasted roles with awesome actors. Like Quaz was fine, whatever. But William Jackson Harper is better than that character. So please do you justice with Stephen Yun is my only request. I don't care who he plays as long as he's as awesome as Stephen Yun. Aaron, what do you think? Uh, this is probably the casting announcement that's got my fiance the most excited when she like immediately stumbles upon it out in the wild. Uh, as a big early Walking Dead fan that med school made it so she could not complete the series. Uh, she loves herself some Glenn. So that's good for all of us. And he's just a really talented actor too. You know what I mean? And I like that the report said that like, he's not just like, oh, it's this one movie. He's supposed to be some sort of major character moving forward, which makes me think that we're making uh, Steven Yoon shape bombs now, <laughs> according to David Harbour, uh, which would be great. So 
Yeah, I'm all about it. It, it should be fun. Like I get like I know it was a joke when we were talking about like our predictions episode for this year, but it really does feel like if anything else, Captain America 4 Thunderbolts going to be the big crazy fireworks finale that we all think they are and that's good. That's amazing. Man, Thunderbolts uh I I keep thinking about that David Arbor quote and I'm like what's he talking about? What's he talking about? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Production updates. Charlie Cox. If you go on Twitter and you search Charlie Cox, everybody in New York City seems to be finding Charlie Cox somewhere. So the man (laughs) has arrived in New York City, and I don't think he gets a a moment of privacy. Everybody's taking pictures of Charlie Cox in the New York City streets, which means Daredevil Born Again is getting ready to film. Uh, They said, you know, production was supposed to start February. You know, I think February, March time. Maybe they're running a little, little late, but... The Daredevil Born Again is about to start production. Charlie's up there. My question is, what else? What, once these things start production, I always go back to like Deadpool 2. Um, and they before that started production, they released photos of Cable and Domino uh, and the new characters because they knew they were going to be filming outside. So they're like, well, we might as well control the first look at these characters rather than having just Jared get potato quality photos on a sniper lens you know, from a mile away that look, you know, not the way we want them to look. Uh, but I mean, we all look at them photos. Thanks, just Jared. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but what do you want? What do you think we might see? What do you think there's other, like anything you want to see? I'm trying to, I just want to see John Bernthal. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm getting at here. I'm hoping we, that's what I want. See, I feel like any like character cameos like that are going to be like so heavily guarded on a sound set. Like they, no one is going to know that those people are in the show outside of like, oh, John Bernthal was in the same zip code. Let's take that however you will. I, I would love it if they pulled a Deadpool 2 and they showed like what Matt's costume is going to look like in the show. Like before we get those Just Jared photos, I would love it. I know like Adam Barnhart and company are all like, oh, the black and red suit would be really cool to see. I would love to see that in some capacity. I, I don't know. I feel like there's so much possibility especially when there's 18 episodes of the show, we could get a lot from set photos. I remember um, when I used to do so many Walking Dead interviews. I forget who it was with. I don't think it was John Bernthal, but somebody on The Walking Dead, because John Bernthal did come back to The Walking Dead, but somebody was telling me a story once in an interview about how when they went to The Walking Dead set, oh, it was Lenny James. Lenny James, who plays Morgan Jones on The Walking Dead. He came back to the show, I think, in season five, season six, season five, wow, in the Alexandria story, whatever. And he was telling me how he, when he got an apartment, he wasn't allowed to lease an apartment. When he flew in, he wasn't allowed to like go get a, like they, everything had to be like controlled by the production to keep it a secret that he was coming back to the show. Like to the point that like he was wearing like stuff over his head when he'd leave the house because they didn't want him spotted in, in Atlanta. And if AMC was doing that, I think Marvel might do some like John Travolta face off stuff on some of these people when they're not on set. <laughs> that was for me. That was yeah. I, I think I got there as soon as like I was like, oh, I could make a John. Uh, fa- I was gonna say just face off, but I was like, if I say John Travolta, I could have really got. I could have really killed you if I also said Nicolas Cage. <laughs> what do you? Is there anything you guys want to think we might see? Want to see Aaron Jamie? In the in the grand scheme of things, I just it would be so cool if Tatiana was there. But I know that that would be the number one thing that, that we would, would absolutely wild. not see. Like no. Kevin Feige is going to tackle you himself <laughs> if you try to take that. They're just like a your... tennis ball on a stick, and they're going to just like CGI her in after the fact, and like that's all we would get from set photos. She's very a very expensive character is ru- is rumored to make a cameo in Daredevil Born Again, which is what we just gonna call She-Hulk all the time now. Uh, <laughs> it's been in two interviews and Kat Coro's uh, interview with us. So yeah, I, that would be cool. I hope they build an actual Avengers Tower and tell us who bought it. <laughs> and uh, on the production front, a uh, new report said uh, Deadpool 3 is going to start filming on May 1st. And given how Hugh Jackman is relentlessly in the gym. That seems pretty accurate. Uh, I can't wait to get a little bit more casting info about Deadpool 3 because I think it's inevitable. I think they're going to have to release some stuff. They can, like, they're like they not going to be able to do a Luke Skywalker in the MCU. We It all gets out there for some reason. So I think exciting times ahead for 
MCU casting news. All right, let's keep it moving here. Uh, a thing that all of you were talking about when we got on uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania box office is I think the highest, or like the, the steepest fall in uh, the history of the franchise. So it fell 69% in week two, but still managed to triumph over our beloved cocaine bear, which is strange. I don't understand how that exactly happened. I have a, a story about this. There's a tiny, tiny line about this in the Hollywood Reporter where if you're not in California or you don't know anybody in California or maybe you don't read Google Alerts and congratulations on your wonderful life out in the cabin in the woods that somehow still can watch phase zero. But here in California, there was a massive rain and snowstorm in places where there's not supposed to be rain and especially not supposed to be snow. I have a very funny image of an In-N-Out burger covered in snow on my phone which looks like one of those AI generated curse things. So no one was going to see Ant-Man. Our power went out for about four hours on Friday and I was not like, you know what? We should go down to AMC and just for Nicole Kidman and then watch Ant-Man again. We didn't do that. So I think that might have a little bit to do with it. Also, most of the people who really, really wanted to see MCU, like that's the newest MCU movie, probably went out to see it before, but also, Unless Jonathan Majors can dethrone Jonathan Majors at the box office, I don't really see how it doesn't win the box office again this week. What do you guys think? I, I want to say that I, I kind of I agree with you because even though there was no way I was going to see Ant-Man again, I didn't see Cocaine Bear because of the rain here. It was terrible um, I, I So uh, I, I like that theory. Uh, but I, I think Creed 3 is taking it. I think Creed 3 is absolutely going to win the box office. And if it doesn't, I'm going to be shocked and sad because I think it's going to be so good. I'm down yeah, Creed Three is going to crush at the box office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I do think the weather was probably a little bit of a factor, but I do think Ant Man was always going to take a drop in, in week two. Oh, for sure. I'm just saying that like half of California being like, oh no, we're not going outside, probably doesn't help too. Oh yeah, it's like mm -hmm. no. I was I was out there this weekend and I I saw it. Y'all are not built for rain. <laughs> no, <laughs> not oh, at all. Mm -mm. My goodness, I did not leave my hotel room on Sunday. I was like, forget it, forget it. I'm not going out there. It's the wilderness. It's scary. No one knows what to do. There you go. There it is. The, I mean... the thing that I'm curious about with Quantum Mania is like, I'm because I do feel like it's this perfect storm of like real life weather stuff and just the word of mouth and the reviews and everything. And then I also, I'm very curious to see once this hits Disney Plus, like how many people are watching it there. I almost feel like there's probably a whole crop of people who might have gone to see it in week two if the hype around it was better and they felt a reason to go see it. And now they might just be waiting until they can watch it at home. So I'm very curious to see like how it ends up being the most viewed movie that has ever premiered disney plus or something like that i mean that's that seems like where we're headed for real like i i read a, th a thread on twitter where someone said that basically people are already paying a certain amount of money a month per Dis like month for disney plus and that that's your big expense and that they use the movie theater now as more as big huge experiences shout out to claudia i think i'll put who said that like yeah and i'm like that's probably right because love and thunder has wild views on disney plus despite all the word about eternals is the most viewed thing on in the Marvel section, apparently, which is amazing, partly because it's long and then otherwise because people just didn't want to go to the theater. So I don't be surprised when that big, biggest premiere since Hocus Pocus 2 hits, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hits the Disney Plus front homepage. And I think that these box office drops, until Marvel finds a new stride where mainstream audiences and everybody gets all fired up like they used to, I think this week two box office drop is going to be a kind of common because... It's just like all of us, like hardcore fans, we are rushing out first weekend. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like everybody's Marvel fans are still going first weekend. There's still a lot of Marvel fans. We're still going to go see everything because we want to see what's next in the MCU. And that's a lot of people. And then these reviews determine week two and repeat viewings and all that stuff. So, and like you said, I think the Disney plus stuff is a huge factor in that as well. Some people, you know, if it doesn't, if it's not getting really positive word of mouth and reviews, they'll just wait. Why not wait? You're going to get it. You're already paying for it. So I think that until they really find a stride and the story ramps up again and people really invest it, I think that the week one to week two drop is going to continue to maybe not be this bad, but I think it's going to be pretty steep for, for some of these titles. I don't know. I think Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is going to be. I was going to say that. I think yeah, Guardians is the exception. Uh, yeah. I think there's, I, mm -hmm. I really, people love them so much. And like, I don't know. I just have such blind faith in James Gunn that I'm like, I'm, it's going to be great. It's going to be such a good movie. 
Uh, I also think it's the thing is like on paper, it's not going to necessarily tie into the multiverse saga and all of this like homework of things that you needed to have seen in phase four. You could just have seen Endgame, Infinity War, the holiday special, and then now volume three, and you probably would still get the gist of it. So I'm sure that's going to be a huge bonus too, is that like people who haven't kept up with every single part of the MCU are probably still going to enjoy it. And so. before Chudy, uh, like, you know, him, the high evolutionary and Kang being best buds in the last third of this movie in before that, <laughs> uh, also, uh, I, I mean, all, all I'm here, everything I hear about Guardians is like, I only hear good things about it. So yeah. I can't, I just, I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be, yeah, I think Guardians is here, here to save us all. It's going to be the best yes. movie of the year. It's number one most anticipated and it was not highly enough ranked in the phase zero composite rankings. We're moving on. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, the, the thing that's here to save us all, uh, Elizabeth Olsen uh, was at Confest. I see what you did there. Wow. What a... <laughs> uh, she was at Confest Con and uh, and she talked about Scarlet Witch's return. And uh, we got a clip. Check it out. What future storyline for Wanda do you want? Um. Well, honestly, if I were to tell you exactly what I would want, I think I would maybe be spoiling something because Kevin. <laughs> Kevin Feige genuinely asks us what we want to do with the character, and then he does it. So <laughs> I think what I... I don't know if I can share, but I just want to come back. So what we're hearing is that she's coming back, and whatever's happening, she's getting what she wants. Uh, I, I know when I interviewed her, she said she wanted some uh, Witch's Road stuff. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know. Put but she wanted to what? Oh, uh, oh, uh, the witch's row. Like Ooh. so, like the like so. Uh, putting those puzzle pieces together. What I'm hearing is she's coming back, and it's already solidified. Because if it wasn't, she would have just told the audience what she wanted. What do you guys think? It's like she's a witch or something. She just manifests <laughs> these storylines, and they come to life. I love it. I, I would love the Witch's Road stuff. I would also love like Children's Crusade. I feel like if there's a way to like make the Young Avengers stuff finally happen, that might be a really easy way to do it while still having Wanda there. Like I'm I'm just glad that she's saying like there is stuff in the works. Like that is very good to hear. If you're talking about getting more back to things that people want to see, obviously we all want Wanda back. I don't I don't even understand. I know that they probably got caught flat footed by how popular WandaVision was. But man, oh man, uh, just having her off the board for this amount of time and the fan base being that like engaged that if you saw the Phase Zero tournament last year, you know how engaged the WandaVision fans are, the army. So I, I, I'm have her yeah, come back. Still... Have her come back, please. Oh, she'll be back. <laughs> Bring. I just want that. I want that era of my life back. The WandaVision era was un, unmatched the greatest moment of all our lives i think I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and the I academy know. award for greatest <laughs> moment of all our lives goes to wandavision <sighs> all right <sighs> jenna added one thing to our rundown here that we that i overlooked when i was yeah. the show gee i wonder why brandon overlooked this you'll, you'll <laughs> totally we're understand supposed why. To <laughs> um so <laughs> Last week, they announced that Rogers the Musical is actually happening IRL. It will have a limited engagement in at Disney's stuff in California. Um, I, Jamie, take it away. I know you have so many oh. thoughts about this. I, I, the amount of messages and like tags I got that day was really beautiful. Like, like I was like, yeah, everybody, I saw the news. Thank you. Uh, um, <laughs> I, the fact, okay, the fact that it's a one act, that means we're getting, it's not just we're showing up and we're going to watch the song again. There's more. There's juice. There's meat. A whole one act. That's a half of a whole musical. I mean, I a musical's like over two hours. I doubt it's going to be like an hour and ten minutes, but it could be because that's what an act is. So oh, I'm getting over my my butt over to Disney. Um, uh, who's sending me? <laughs> over Let's over go. under over under on the runtime, like the Indiana Jones show. Ooh, yeah. that uh, mm. I would say. I feel like that's a safe amount. <laughs> yeah. One time I got chosen to be in the Indiana Jones show and it was uh, the true highlight. <laughs> <of my life. laughs> 
You got to Forget the one vision era. That, that I need to go on stage. <laughs> but it was like before smartphones, so my stepdad like oh. has like picture on his like teeny tiny little clicky phone like this. So there's no oh. really good evidence of it, but it was a highlight. Uh, it was no one division era, but it was up there. That's awesome. I'm that's so awesome. excited yeah. when this I happened. Have the whole Agents of Fandom crew that's in the uh, that's in Layla and all that. Cry. And everybody, and PJ and everybody I know. who went to. What's that? I they, they cried. Happen. They just came here. They yeah, missed they it by like a couple of Now, guess what? They just had to book a return trip. It was a round mm-hmm. trip, round trip. You got to go yeah. back for Rogers the Musical. All right, y'all. Well, we promised you Jeff Loveness would be on the show fielding questions about Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, and Avengers the Kang Dynasty. I promise you are coming with some heat in this next part of the show. So, in just a minute, we'll be right back with Mr. Jeff Loveness. to phase zero bd here and i am hyped to welcome this week's guest for our interview segment this is going to be really cool guys uh you may know him from the pages of marvel comics where he was a writer you may know him because he's shown his face on one of the best shows of all time the office and he has just given us ant-man and the wasp quantum media he is currently writing avengers the kang dynasty and he's still giving us his time and we are so grateful for that please welcome to phase zero for an exclusive interview mr jeff loveness hey happy to do it brandon good to see you well listen, i'm gonna put i'm gonna i'm gonna put you on the spot with a little marvel question uh sure. to, to do a little icebreaker here to get to know you there is a correct mm-hmm. answer to this by the way okay back in civil war were you team captain america or team iron man in the movies or the comics we're gonna go movies movies you know, it's tough. I guess I'm going to go in this era that we're living in. It's tough. I think I might go Team Iron Man. I think there's a moment in that movie where you could have easily had a conversation. <laughs> it's like, hey, uh, there's, we got to go. These super soldiers are attacking. Let's take five and do this. Uh, in the comic books, I think I might have gone for Cap at the time. I think he made more of an argument in the comic books. But in the movies, yeah, you might want to have you might want to you might want to have some laws about being the hulk <laughs> you might want to you might want to you might want to have some laws about a big guy with an infinity stone in his head that can go through walls i don't know <laughs> somebody with some taste it's about time it's about time I, I appreciate that answer that was the right answer on both fronts actually i agree with both comics and movies uh but now let's mm-hmm. let's chop it up about quantum mania i mean uh i i love to hear about this experience first i want to start the movie was called ant-man and the wasp quantum mania so I would love to hear, like, did the did the title, did the the term quantum mania inspire anything, or was that inspired by? No, I know? think I don't. I did not come up with the title. That was not me. Uh, it was Ant Man three in my head. <laughs> I just had that was my. Uh, but uh, I know I don't know if that was Peyton or you know Marvel people. Uh, 
but it was fun to see and it was fun that they put ant-man in the title i'm sure that played a part in it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah ant-man a part of quantum mania but sadly no i can't take credit for that uh, I, uh, I don't fair enough. Royalties. so when you first you know you, you get the gig I, I would love to hear about the whole process like how does it start what is that first conversation like how much do they tell you how much do you give them ideas for like once that what, what is step one of like what is ground zero of collaborating for the, in the mcu it was great. I mean, there's a pretty open canvas. I think they had been developing it for a little bit before me, like before they hired a, a writer. Um, so Peyton wanted it to be like this kind of tonal shift and like this Ant-Man quantum realm adventure. And Kane the Conqueror and MODOK were on the table. That was basically it, if I remember correctly. And so the rest was like forging like, okay, what's your take on Kane? How can he possibly go up against Ant-Man? What's his situation? How is he different? potentially where could this guy go but really focus on this movie right now what are the dynamics at play what's the janet of it all and i think the movie came together when i realized like oh oh janet and kang should have a history like there's a reason she doesn't tell anyone about this place there's a re she's like a spy that had to bury terrible things that they did in the cold war and never talk about even if it's a problem like or, or like really you give her that sort of a history of violence quality. And even when they're down there, the more truth she tells is just going to shame her in front of her daughter. And like, it's, I, I think it came from a very real place of like family trauma of like, if you've got some problems in your family or dark secrets or whatever, they come out at the worst times or in the, and they only come out like piecemeal, or you can kind of see your mom. It like, it hurts them to tell you, you know, or it hurts or it, in a way they don't want you to see who they really are or like they want they want to be that version of you in their head or so i thought with hope van dyne and janet that'd be kind of interesting because like in her mind janet van dyne to hope is this hero who blew up a nuclear missile and sacrificed herself for 30 years and then she finally got this beautiful thing to save her and bring her back but 30 years have gone by <laughs> you know she's not she's not five anymore or whatever and like and to have that gulf between them, I thought would be really interesting. And then to get to see that your mom is a hero, yes, but man, she unleashed something terrible down here. And you see the the guilt and the weight. And then she gets to step up and kind of face her mom's tormentor. Um, I don't know, man. That's kind of where all that kind of sprung from. Yeah. And then on the Scott Lane side, it um, I mean, he lost a ton of time with Cassie, even, you know. There was the blip, of course, but then he was in parole. Then he was in jail again. Like doing the right thing has really cost this guy a lot of time and he can't get that back. And so he's in kind of that like Rocky three mode where he's like resting on his laurels, maybe a little bit. He's getting some coffee from people like life's relatively good. But again, there's this kind of gulf and he feels guilty that he sees his daughter maybe starting to do some of the things that he did. And he doesn't know how to tell her to stop you know, because he was the inspiration for her. Uh, and then you get to kind of play off that story with her. I wanted to give Cassie a full arc because like I wanted to be very careful and, you know, there's degrees of this or, you know, discussion to be had, but like, I didn't want her to come off like the teenage daughter in like Jurassic Park, the lost world <laughs> who like, I know her thing, like she does gymnastics and then she uses gymnastics to kick a raptor. <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, that's so like, I wanted to make sure Cassie had like a fully realized arc and messed up a lot and made a lot of mistakes and got people hurt and like felt the blame and like I, to really make her like a normal Marvel character, the way Spider-Man is like he really messes up and the, the plot happens because of his mess ups, you know? And yeah. so that seemed like a fun connection with Scott and Cassie to have. And then Scott and Kane, it's like, well, who's lost more time than Kane, the conqueror and Scott Lane. Like you have that little devil's bargain you can do in there or that, that weak point that Kane can use on him and also on on Janet and you kind of saw the decision she made based on that. So I don't know like I started to kind of carve that stuff out and those felt like naturally kind of the story lanes to go down. Yeah, and then yeah. of course you have Modoc and like he's he's got a connection <laughs> to Scott but more on that later I suppose. Oh yeah, we'll we'll get we'll get to Modoc. I love that you opened the movie on on Janet and uh and Kang meeting I like I feel like the the earlier MCU movies would always start on kind of like this villain scene like very commonly right. they start like a villain scene and, the, and for, then you'd cut back to like the happy hero or the person becoming the hero and you yeah. just know it just built these stakes right in there so I love that you did that and I, I mean I remember in Ant-Man the Wasp 
they had the little flash with like a little city and all that kind of stuff. It was like, well, we might go there in the third one. And here we, here we are. You guys did go there. Uh, how much like specifically for like Janet's story and Krylar came in, like Bill Murray came in and had a history with Janet. It seems like you guys really got to dig into Janet and we got a lot of that on screen. Did we get everything that you've written down or thought of, or was there some stuff that was like, Oh, well, this might not even make the cut. For good reason, probably, yes. Uh, <laughs> a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, for very good reason, some stuff had to probably be cut out. I had a big Werner Herzog-voiced uh, Herzog ant in like a big Ninja Turtle suit <laughs> prosthetic. <laughs> uh, that didn't make it. Yeah, yeah, there was definitely more. I mean, but but again, I, I think the cut that we have is the is is you know the, the the cut that people should see, of course. But like, yeah, there's always stuff that gets trimmed down or changed. There was some... Um, a little more Janet and Kang stuff, more of the flashback in the quantum realm, more of their time together, how they fought each other, and like you know, kind of what happened in the Gulf between. Uh, more of her. I love their fight. I, I love when they. Uh, when oh they yeah, I think that scene is so cool, and, and you yeah. just love Michelle Pfeiffer. She makes such a brave, like selfless choice. She's so. Um, good. Yeah, there was more. There was more hope. There was some hope stuff, like her glimpse or her view of the multiverse. Um, more hope and uh, hope and scott stuff i mean there's more of everybody you know yeah, I, uh, but like yeah i think i think the core storyline shown through and that's that is kind of the process of making movies you know like there's i got cut <laughs> i got cut. i was a i had a beautiful scene that uh, I, I was blown up by modak <laughs> so, what you know filmmaking is sacrifice filmmaking is is agony and sacrifice <laughs> Well, now we got to get you in Kang Dynasty, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Being blown up by Moda. Got to ask yeah. yourself, what would Joe Russo do? You know. Oh yeah, I'll uh, do exactly that. I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> so well, okay. So I want. I do want to talk about Modoc, and yeah. I mean Modoc, Darren. I, 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 I'm not one of the people who's like a purist from the comics. You gotta. Right to the you know george tarleton i'm okay with like tony stark playing such a big role in peter parker's life in the mcu yeah, yeah. you know stuff like that but i'm curious because you guys really established that modok has a, a long-running history he talked about i've invented more than you can ever imagine right. and you brought in a history a piece of history from the mcu with darren cross i loved you about you know the the drawing board that you put up there on modok and and what you know how, how you crafted this version how much what did he create down there yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had uh, <laughs> besides a... besides famous booty memes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh um, my God, that's amazing. Man, that man does not <laughs> skip ass day. <laughs> does <laughs> <He> not. <laughs> I was shocked at how like erotic. I'm like, God, does Modok have a better body than me? <laughs> like, just, uh, whew, good for him. Good for uh, him. No, uh, Modok was on the table from the beginning. I think it was like Peyton and and Stephen Broussard, our executives' idea to do Darren Cross Modok, and I just jumped at that. I thought I thought that was a brilliant take, and it instantly brought the character to life for me. I forgot if I said this already, but like so much has happened since Ant Man one, <laughs> and like and he doesn't know any of it, <laughs> and I thought it would be so funny. Like suddenly Scott Lane rolls back into your life. Oh yeah, he's an Avenger. He's been an Avenger for a couple of years now. No big deal. He's time traveled twice with Captain America. <laughs> like he's he's oh yeah, Hope, the woman you were in love with. Oh yeah, we've been dating for years and Hank respects me. What have you been up to? <laughs> like yeah. to build this real sort of like hood upon uh small man, uh like death of a salesman agony into Modoc and Darren Cross felt really fun to me. And like to give him this sort of downfallen like crestfallen george costanza rage <laughs> felt <laughs> that, that felt like a good take on the character because if you want like a purely a pure comics adaptation like i mean he's been great in that hulu show uh i know that there's like a video game where he pops up mm -hmm. but it felt like doing a pure comics adaptation wasn't working with the continuity that we had like they've already done aim they've had aldrich killian it would be a little bit of too much shoe leather to really get all that stuff in for the story we were telling. But yeah, in this story, the idea is basically like, yeah, he, he gets trapped down in the quantum realm and he becomes the really, really, really shitty Darth Vader to Kang's emperor. Like you have, he's trying so hard to like fit this mold and dude, you're just a big head. It's not working out. <laughs> dude, I'm so glad you said that. Cause I fully, I was like, hold on. This is Anakin Skywalker right here. I, absolutely, I, he, oh, absolutely intentional. It's like, yes, okay. he, he thinks he's rolling up in like a Darth Vader suit and nope, still a big head. <laughs> you're not. I, I, 
when he said when he said Darren is dead, I was like, oh my god, this is this is Anakin Skywalker becoming Darth Vader. This Darren, is this- the last thing Darren saw before he got sucked into the quantum realm was probably about Episode Three, <laughs> and it's been on his mind the whole time. <laughs> He's a big prequels guy. Darren Cross loves the prequels. Oh, of course he does. Of course he does. Okay, I want to run a theory by you, and I've seen this. I've seen this often on YouTube and on TikToks and everything. Um, there's a theory that at the end of the movie, when they exit the quantum realm, because like Scott gets charged for the coffee this time, the coffee's like a thousand dollars a cup. I don't know. That might just be San Francisco. Uh, yeah. But uh, the theory is because of those slight changes that people noticed, they exited the quantum realm in a different universe. All mm-hmm. I'll say to you is, what say you to this theory? I think it's very interesting <laughs> and I confirmed can't, i can't say much uh uh it's it's it actually is not too far off from some possibilities but i can't say anything and for now the only important thing to say is that the multiverse is limitless and scott lang was the man who saved the universe in endgame and now he may be the person who accidentally uh, fucked up the multiverse for everybody. <laughs> so, you hate to see it. You never know. It's, it's so far things are good. He's back to the life that he thinks he has and loves, but he doesn't have the assurity that he did in the top of the movie that Rocky Three Swagger is gone, and he suddenly the most carefree, luckiest guy in the in the MCU has a huge kind of shadow hanging over him, and he doesn't know what to do about it. Um, that felt like an interesting tonal shift for Scott Lane, and we'll see where that goes forward. But uh, who knows, man? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I'll tell you who knows you know. <laughs> that was just messing oh. with you. Okay, so I do want to talk about the multiverse of it all because I, a common thing from fans and our readers, and I feel this yeah. sometimes myself, is that multiverse makes stakes just feel kind of weird sometimes. It's like, oh. you know, how do you keep a sense of stake? My question is not how do you make me feel a sense of stakes for like the characters from the MCU because I care about the characters from the MCU no matter what universe they're in. My question is, how do you think you get people to care about other universes? Because I remember like going into Secret Wars, you know, you had the ultimate universe, you had different universes and we are now, the quantum realm is the most fleshed out, I'd say other universe that the MCU has delivered so far. Is that like, what is your, you you have experience with this, you have some multiverse, you know, experience. I'd love to hear, what, what do you, how do you kind of continue to have stakes when you're doing multiverse stories? Yeah, I think I think that's the big challenge and that's the big question to always be facing because like we've also seen a lot of these multiverse stories now, you know, we've seen Rick and Morty, we've seen everywhere all at once, uh, you know, there's a couple other multiverse things coming out. The idea of like Spider-Man meeting another Spider-Man is no longer that fresh of an idea, <laughs> you know, like there's there's going to be a, a trilogy about that, you know, like and that was beautifully done. And so you can't quite do other people from other universes slightly different you know we we, everyone's seen the star trek episode where spock's got a goatee you know like you can't quite do the evil versions either so it really is a challenge and i almost don't try to think of this as a multiversal story i think of it as almost like a sliding doors or like base it more on the characters and their choices less than like the visual gimmick or um I'm not quite sure if we even have a full answer for this, but like, I try not to think of them as mirror dimensions or off there. These are completely valid, unique places. It's like another country or the cold war. It's like, these are places where you, maybe they're not like us, but they, they matter just as much. And it challenges our own superiority. Cause like we root for the MCU because we've seen those movies, but like, much like America doesn't really care if we leave our air conditioners on all night, you know, it's like suddenly, climate change is coming for all of us and maybe we need to see the people that aren't us as much either um i feel like what you that what you were just saying it was kind of perfectly summarized by cassie's line in this film like just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean it's not happening that's kind of the stance the heroes are going to have to have about other universes where there is other life yeah yeah yeah. and you know i mean it's all it's all in flux but like i think multiverse is even uh, that's what am i even trying to say i'm just focusing on writing a good movie with the compelling characters that we have the multiverse is almost window dressing like that that is like a fun visual and character question uh, in a story but yeah you can't get too lost in the sauce there because then you're just doing you know garfield is purple instead of orange you know <laughs> you got to you got to you got to just hammer in the characters and let the fun multiverse stuff come from their choices and maybe where the story leads you and don't really build the movie around those worlds. 100%. Now, now I'm not asking you, is this happening? But I do want to ask your thoughts on things like this because we've had like Gamora come back to life through a different timeline. 
like Steve Rogers and Tony Stark. Personally, I, Iron Man is my all time favorite superhero mm-hmm. in a film. Had the best ending possible. Like, how right. do you top that? You have all these conversations. You know, is is Downey coming back for Secret Wars, or is he going to be in the multiverse? Is Tom Cruise going to play Iron Man? Well, I, I love to hear what you think about the idea of not necessarily them, but characters. You know. Like those characters guys. coming back, yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea of bringing these characters back after they have kind of had that arc, like what? How do you do? What is the nuance to that? What is like the, you know, that is probably the nuance of that is that it's probably about fifteen levels above my head. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't have an extra ninety million dollars lying around, so I don't know. I don't know how to get these actors <laughs> on a on a creative level or a story level. I can't yeah. say anything as far as what the plans are. And I don't, frankly, I don't know any of those plans. Sure, I, don't, sure. I don't think, but on just a story level, I think that's the beauty of Marvel comics and these more like grand canvases is that like, there's also a lot of different corners of it to love. And you got to give each corner of it their time to shine in a way of like, Iron Man is fantastic. But if you had asked me about 25 years ago, is Iron Man a top five superhero? I would say, who, who's Iron Man? You know, like it, these generations have cycles to them. And I think it's almost cool to kind of build up these newer characters that have a ton of potential and that have a ton of um, fresh life to them. And you get, instead of just playing the hits and bringing people back, I think it's worth exploring kind of what Star Trek did, like make the next generation, like make this, like people have their own touch points. They're jumping on points. They're jumping off points. But it's cool to have these chapters to these universes that you can kind of build a home around. I loved, so I don't know, I I think you get stronger by building and you don't get stronger by doing a little cameo fest. Um, But who knows, man, I I really, I have no clue and I'm maybe I'm already dead and I'm in hell right now. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Oh, we got we got a few years to to let the excitement build and see what you yeah. guys cook up. I can't wait to see it, man. Oh, I, I, I want to talk about a different character. Yeah. Uh, Peyton Reed said in an interview, I forget who the interview is with, but he he was asked any other characters you'd want to work with. They specifically asked him about X Men. He said, no, hmm. not really X Men, but I would love to work on Nova. He found Nova to be interesting. You've written Nova. With I have both Sam Alexander and Richard Rider. Nova. Yeah, yeah. Is- is my favorite character in comics. I remember. Nice. No, I love Nova. Sp- I love Rich Rider. I love Sam too. Rich is my favorite. I, if is, Nova okay, yeah. were to come to the MCU, what do you think? As somebody who has, you know, your pen has graced those pages. Uh, what do you think is the key thing to that that somebody has to do to get Nova right if he were to be adapted to the MCU? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I haven't thought too much about Nova. Thanks for reading the comic. That's really nice. I love that story. And like, I think. I mean, I'll, let me just be selfish and just based off of my comic or something i think there is something really fun in that sam alexander getting his dad's helmet and it's a it's very spielberg movie it's very amblin you know you Mm -hmm. get sucked into kind of this Mm -hmm. adventure i think that's a fun way to take it i like sam alexander as another sort of peter parker miles morales kamala khan age equivalent i think that you know that build there's that trinity in the comics like nova miles morales and, and kamala uh they make a nice little friend group He's good in that way. But yeah, Rich Ryder, he's got a bit of like Top Gun energy to him, or he's got a little bit of like uh, Dash Rendar. <laughs> like, <laughs> that the Empire. That's a deeper well, cut. Star Wars extended. But like, he, yeah. he is this almost like lawman. It's almost like justified. I wouldn't say he's like a cop. He's not a Green Lantern, but at the same time, he's like this adventurer out there in the cosmos. And yeah. like, um, he's like a, he's not a comfortable being at home. He's a sailor in that way. And I like, treating novas as like almost the the guys who go the farthest and like almost these scouts or these like far reaching adventurers who go out there like to use the emptiness of space would be really cool i think in a nova movie and like you can literally rocket yourself through space and to show how like beautiful that you don't need a ship you don't need a, a giant dragon you fly inside of like it's just you and the stars and that's kind of a beautiful, I mean, you can do some 2001 imagery with that of breaking through yeah. light barriers. Like, oh my God. I, I think there's I... like, and, a, and at the end of the day, it's like a buddy cop, you know, you can do a training day vibe or whatever. Like oh. there's a fun, there's a fun d- DNA built into it. Yeah. And you, I mean, you brought Rich back to life in that, in that book um, for the, I think he was gone a few years at that point. Yeah. Um, but 
I, I keep my idea. And if I ever, next time I see Feige, I'm going to be like, listen, just yeah. make Rich Sam's dad. Make Rich like Sam. Like that, then you get both, best of both worlds. And then at the end of the movie, we set up, you know, we get a rich environment. And Xandar's already destroyed. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm yeah. just I, saying. They've got, they've got a built in sort of like Jedi thing where it's like, yeah, the Novas are gone. There's only like a couple of them yeah. left. Oh um, and what what made them better than space cops? You know, like why were they? Why are they so important? And what's cool about them? Yeah. They strike me as like um, adventurers in a cool way. So get Timothy yeah. Oliphant on the phone. Let's get <laughs> <laughs> from uh, from Mandalorian to uh, yeah. to Anova. All right. So now I do have to ask a little bit about Kang Dynasty here. Boy. And uh, okay, I, I the, the reviews came out for him, man, and I'm I don't know. I don't agree with most of the reviews. I I don't. I think they were kind of tough, man uh but uh, i'm curious yeah, that's, and happened. that's i mean i know that's part of the game so it's i, I don't want to harp on any of that but i am curious like when that thing happened when when like fans are really loving the movie our community is like i'm seeing so much positivity in the timeline from from marvel fans and you know there's always mixed reactions but i'm seeing a oh, lot of a love for quantum mania from our from our listeners from our followers and then the reviews are you know they are what they are i'm curious when you know well you have time between films like does does the kind that kind of stuff factor into the work on like Kang Dynasty? Do you like say like, well, you know, here's what they said about this. Do less, do more. You know, like how does the how does that even factor into the on a creative level? Yeah, I mean, I'm in the process of that right now, so certainly it's been a a wild couple of weeks to, to be writing the biggest movie of all time and to see <laughs> to see yourself like uh, portrayed in this way. But yeah, I mean, it's a mix of both, man. Like, cause I really do like the movie and, you know, making movies is a fight and there's always, you know, you always look at your own work and you, you see the flaws or you see ways to do it better. But like, man, writing Jonathan Majors was like the thrill of a lifetime and getting that Modoc stuff in there was such a joy and like working with all the, it could not have been like a more thrilling experience. And so like, yeah, like I, I think it's been really charming and really heartwarming to like see it find its audience and the people who get it really get it. <laughs> and like, oh, yeah, it's kind of fun to have a movie that it kind of it's kind of fun to have a movie that people can have strong opinions on and kind of like take swings at. And like I had to get used to that. Like, certainly, it you know, it's a it's a whack to the face. But. I also feel like I've grown up a little bit. I'm alive and it's like I'm like, very excited to write the next one. And you know, as a writer, it's a mix. Like you gotta, you gotta learn some stuff and you gotta see what people are saying. But at the same time, you gotta hold on and be like, no, I love Modoc. I'm going to do it more. <laughs> so it's a mix of both. Like I, it's yeah. not affecting the work right now, but I, I, you know, we'll see if, if my badge has been locked out at Disney, <laughs> we'll see if I can get in the building. Dude, I, I, I'll say this, the the most common thing I see, even from the people who are saying negative things is that there's so much respect for the swings you guys took. So I, 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 I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, thanks, you guys, man. Dude, you get, I, I respect that. It's you know, you know, a lot of people are going to watch this, and you guys threw Moda. Like, I respect it, and I loved a well, lot they, of the stuff in this that, film. So that's what Peyton and I. That that means a lot. That's like what Peyton and I were really going for. It's like you know what? No one expects Ant Man three to be this wild psychedelic space adventure with like you know a big villain. Like let's let's go with some absurd like gag comedy, and then let's have an actual villain. Like let's try to make this a fun flowing adventure, like a '90s adventure movie or something. Yeah. And man, I love it. So it's nice to talk to people that that like it. And you know, it's good to yeah, it's good to stay off the internet for a few days too. Hey man, so, I, so it's all every, every once in a while. It's good to unplug. All right, so I, I got. So. I, 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 these are the questions. I don't know if you're going to be able to touch them, but Kang sure. in the comics, obviously, huge ties to Fantastic Four being a descendant right, of Reed. Right. Fantastic Four characters like X Men, they're all finally home. We've never had an Avengers movie with these characters. Can we expect any sort of uh, comic-like connections there? No, it's like I, I think I think all that stuff is pretty far away. I mean, I know they're making Fantastic Four, uh, but that's its own thing. So, no, I mean, I'm look, I'm the biggest X Men guy in the world. Uh, no, no, no. That's I think I think that's being saved for a bit. Uh, that that's you know, uh, but. We got, we got, you know, these Avengers are in trouble. They got a lot sure. going on with Kane. They, they, they got more than enough to handle. <laughs> that actually perfectly sets up my next question because Avengers Infinity War was very much a Thanos movie. Like it was right. called Avengers, but Thanos was the protagonist. Would you say Kang could be like the the, the protagonist of uh, that's of at least Dynasty? that's at least how I'm trying to write him. And you know, we'll see how the structure changes and how the flow works. But like, he's got to be his own hero, and and especially Kane the Conqueror and Ant Man thought he was. Or uh, maybe he wouldn't use the word hero, but 
he's on a crusade and he's doing it for a reason. Uh, so I think, yeah, secretly it's a Kane movie, but of course, you know, you have to keep the, the, the forward gas going with the Avengers, but yeah, in the back of my mind, it's a Kane movie. Ah, oh, dude, I can't wait to see this. Oh my God, 2025, get here. All right, my last question. I, I, is there anybody you and Destin are really, really excited that you can say like, this is a character, this is a, a, a uh, actor I, you're really excited to work with? I can't say specifically. I think I get in trouble. I got to get better at talking to the internet. But like just characters that we like, uh, I mean, I think we're excited for the actors more than even the characters right now because we yeah. have this really good crop of performers like we got Florence Pugh and Jonathan Majors and Letitia Wright. Like we've got such a deep bench of really good actors. And I think um, everyone's going to get their chance to shine. I can't say who <laughs> I can't sure, say, sure, when sure, they will sure. shine, but I think we've got like we've got a deep bench and it's fun to finally put everybody into the game dude every time i talk to you i get more excited for all this stuff like oh I thanks man I, yeah. I, I can't wait to see what you do at kang dynasty i'm, I'm gonna go watch quantum mania again uh dude Jack i appreciate that i can, I can use course. the box office thank you <laughs> <laughs> well listen we at phase zero we love supporting you guys and uh, the fact that you come on and give us time like it means the world that uh you come connect with us i know our listeners love hearing from you that's uh, nice and man and thank you us. and thank you for the energy i can tell like yeah, you do. You have a nice optimism and you have like a joy about this stuff, which is great. Like, I, I really like the heart of where you're coming from with this stuff, because like, Dude. yeah, they're, they're big, fun stories. Like, this is something like there's a joy to comic book storytelling that I really love. Yeah. All right. Well, a huge thank you to Jeff Loveness for joining us on Phase Zero. Everybody, please make sure you leave a thumbs up if you're watching this on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button. We just crossed 10K. Thank you for getting us there. If you're listening to us in a podcast form, send it to your friend. Leave a five-star review. We love you for it. Can't thank Jeff enough for the time. Can't thank the Phase Zero community enough for being so awesome and supportive. We'll be back next week with another awesome episode. I am BD, and I will see you there. 